Welcome back to the Marvel Movie Minute, a daily podcast in which we explore the films of the Marvel Cinematic Universe one minute at a time. In this, our fifth season, we are looking at Joe Johnston's 2011 film, Captain America, The First Avenger. I'm Andy Nelson from the Next Real Film Podcast, and Pete's back. And I'm Pete, and I've been here all week. <laughs> He's just been very quiet, <laughs> quietly sitting, like, I refuse to talk. Well, I got real upset for a few things. I felt you missed some points, but I was also feeling judged, and I didn't want to interrupt, and so I was real quiet. Uh, but now I'm back and I'm full of fire. No, that, that was full of fire was the last three minutes, actually. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. Today we were talking about minute 70, which begins with Colonel Phillips finishing his letter. And it ends with what's going on out there? Something is happening and everybody runs off. We will find out next week. Uh, but not now. For now, we are back talking with Andrew and Joe Dorowski. Hello, you two. Hello. Very glad to be back for this fifth minute here. Uh, we are thrilled. Um, yeah, you, you you found a great week. You got to talk about the reveal of Red Skull and the Tribe Flugeljager. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also got uh, some Colonel Phillips and Agent Carter. You got like everything. Everybody. It's This, um, this is a week full of everybody. Really all, it's great. All the leads. We got, we got Dirty yeah. Bucky and Cleaned Up Bucky in the same scene. <laughs> That's right. The only person you didn't get is Erskine, but they do talk about him. So at least there's that. We, uh, we join as, uh, Colonel Phillips is finishing up his letter and, uh, you know, he, I don't know, we, you talked a little bit about, uh, how much you enjoyed hearing Tommy Lee Jones, uh, Tommy Lee Jones's voice. And I feel like there's this great energy he has here. He's appropriately annoyed and disappointed. Like there's something with him that just carries the energy of the scene just perfectly. I love it. I still contend that he doesn't really know what war movie he's in when he's doing this, <laughs> this one. <laughs> it's just what makes you think I give a damn about this movie is really what's what he's saying. There's a lot of subtext. Yeah. <laughs> he signed up to do a World War II movie and just stand there and deliver some gruff lines. Yep. Been there. That's... Been it. Done it before. We'll do it again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there is that uh, that level of him. But I think some of that is just how he comes across. Like, I, I like to think that secretly, like in his diary, like he's talking about how much he loved his time on this film and how he wishes that he had had a chance to do something that wasn't in the 40s so that he could be coming back to be in other films. I like to think that that is that there is that little Tommy Lee Jones hiding away in there. <laughs> think there's a chance i think he's wearing he's wearing a captain a captain america t-shirt underneath all that garb <laughs> like you know he's he's repping the brand <laughs> we do have agent carter arrive uh, you two hadn't seen agent carter yet but this is uh, your chance to have a little bit of Haley atwell on screen uh, what do you two think of uh, Haley atwell and agent carter as she's portrayed here in the film it, it's really interesting to go back and see agent carter here because like she, she's had such an interesting role in the Marvel universe since then with the agent Carter TV show, then with the what if, and then the, you know, the, the, the captain Carter and multiverse of madness that, um, you, you know, and then other, you, a few other scenes here and there right through, throughout where it's like, she, she shows up a lot more than I think you'd expect after this movie ended. Yes. She's great in this, right? Mm -hmm. She's exactly what she's supposed to be in this. She nails her role. She's memorable. And I think, that's something that like maybe fueled bringing her back so much is it, it made people enjoy her character more than was necessary. Mm. Were you two fans of the show? I watched, I think it's got two seasons. I think I watched one of them, um, but the TV shows um, at least before Disney plus, I felt a hard time like getting pulled into them. Mm. Um, and even with Disney plus, I, I really like about half of them. I'd say, and I, I watch the other half. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I was just sad. very busy with some <laughs> other stuff. And so I missed like the premiere week. And, you know, at that point there wasn't as easily on demand to go catch up. And, uh, and then I never did. And then because of some other choices that have been made in Marvel storytelling, it always felt a little inessential to go back and, <laughs> and catch up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is that. I mean, I guess there's a sense that this, that that particular story, like more than some of the other shows does kind of still have a home in the universe, mm. even if they don't specifically say it, but with, yeah. uh, you know, moments like bringing, uh, Jarvis in, 
into the show or uh, into the movies later yeah and things like that it feels like they're it, it kind of fits but yeah it's it is one of those things where I, it does feel a little less than essential i suppose but i, I do really like Haley atwell in this role and i quite like that we got to see her again as captain carter and <laughs> dr strange of the multiverse of madness um it's uh she, she does a great job what like whatever she's being asked to do she seems to excel at uh i will say as she appears in in this scene it <laughs> Watching it minute by minute. Again, one of those things. It's like nothing ever looks weird until you're looking at it one minute at a time. But seeing her walk through a small door in the side of the tent while the entire side of the tent is open just really felt comical to me this time. As we see people walking by with just massive pipes and and guns and everything. She's just walking through the narrowest door. (laughs) <laughs> why is there a door right there <laughs> or or why is it open i understand like okay right. maybe sometimes the side of the tent is closed and so you need to have a door but when the side of the tent is open like that i feel like she doesn't need to have the door right there <laughs> it only would have been better if it had actually been closed and she actually goes through the process of opening it just to get through <laughs> even though the whole opening's there <laughs> oh my gosh that is too funny too funny I mean, the moment, though, is designed for her to be walking in exactly at the moment when he's talking about uh, Steve Rogers being killed in action. It's designed for us to have her hear that moment. This is the person who has hope. She's brought new photos from a reconnaissance uh, flight to see if there's any action and stuff and, and, and to walk in on this thing where he's writing the letter saying that he's been killed in action. I suppose that, you know, the whole point of it is to get her reaction so that we as the audience can have that emotional connection to her. This is the person who sent him on this mission, and here she is, you know, having, I guess, you know, from a military perspective, when the colonel was saying killed in action, you kind of just buy into it. You're not, he's not saying missing in action, he's literally saying killed in action. This shot in particular, I think I want to, I, I feel like we have to celebrate this shot, because even though it's comically in the side of this open tent, it is like it's set up as a way to give you that perfect like 1940s era like femme fatale cutting a shadow or a silhouette in the door frame Mm -hmm. and even though it's in this weird context because they're in the middle of a jungle or forest uh in the war we still get that and you know that you do because check out that key light on her hair like she is perfectly <laughs> framed and shaped by the light in in this particular shot when she stops there with those pictures and so i you know in, intentional uh it, it is comical it also is <laughs> I, maybe not intentionally <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <right>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's the challenge. But I mean, but, you know, she looks good. And it, I guess for us, the audience, when we're not watching it a minute at a time and we're not kind of paying attention to some of those specific details, yeah. it is the core of the emotion. And, you mm-hmm. know, Pete has had this uh, challenge. And Pete, you know, I have to bring this up every week of of, of Peggy Carter's motivations with Steve as she's kind of like worked through the whole beginning of the film. You know, is she just picking this person and and liking him because he fits in with what uh, Dr. Erskine is looking for for the experiments, or is there an emotional connection as well? Uh, You know, and a lot of it is like, you know, she doesn't seem drawn to puny Steve. It's once he's kind of turned into hunky Steve that, you know, that's when she's suddenly wanting to kind of reach out and and touch someone. Uh, it, so how, do, <laughs> it's how does that abs, play? It's his abs, Andy. You're, you're hiding in metaphor. She no, wants I'm to just, touch it's... his rippling muscles between all the other muscles also rippling. <laughs> yes, it does. But it doesn't play with the 80s commercial reference that I was <laughs> randomly <laughs> pulling suddenly. <laughs> But that's, you know, but that's the whole thing is like, is she in this for the science um, or is she in this because she does start finding this connection with Steve? And at what point does she start finding that? How did you two read the relationship of the two of them over the course of the film? And at what point do you think, oh, she might actually like this guy? I think there's definitely like a clear acknowledgement that she connects with him in a way that she probably doesn't connect with most guys and, and he probably hasn't connected with anybody um it is like when they're driving to the procedure i mean there's moments when she recognizes it like when he when he um takes the flag off the flagpole yeah and he thinks through it and it's like okay he outsmarted you guys and she's like okay like i like him but i don't think she's romantically interested in him i like him for science 
That's what. That's what I I'm like hearing. him as a potential. Test I like subject. him for science. This is, right, this is yeah. a good candidate um, <laughs> right. in more ways than one. Um, but but I don't think she is necessarily like attractive, right? There, and and maybe that's really important for their relationship. Is she needs to like there needs to be a connection before there's an attraction um, for her. And and Steve is you know clearly attracted to her, but he's also just I don't know. Skinny Steve is not going to pursue anybody, right? He's just, it's not that he's not interested. It's that he doesn't feel interesting. And, yeah. um, and even a good way of putting it. getting into this, I think it's maybe like one minute away from right now that there's like, okay, there is a, they're on the same level now, right? They, they're in the same league and can actually flirt in a different way. And, and, and maybe coming up, later on in the movie but i like that they have a clear connection in the car going to the procedure where they have a conversation and it's a- about romance but clearly they're not flirting <laughs> <laughs> that you that you just i cannot believe how much i admire you right now because you said i feel like he uh, he, he, it's not that he's not attracted, it's that he doesn't feel interesting, which demonstrates that you clearly watched the Dr. Phil episode that we sent you as pre-work. That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that was an amazing insight. <laughs> yeah, I am so impressed. Uh, but I think you're, I think you're exactly right. And that's why, I mean, I, you know, the pre-work is, is hard on this one because I think she likes him for science and maybe Maybe she was attracted to him or wanted to sex him also for science until (laughs) this minute and the next minute, because these two minutes are when she realizes, oh, my God, he might be gone. And then it's like a triggering thing. And what we see when she comes in that door and she hears he's killed in action, she's like, oh, my God, now he's gone. What am I going to do? And there is a giant Steve shaped hole in her heart. And that is filled with. I like him not just for science. That's my take. Right. Like it like I'm I'm sad that I won't get to have another conversation with him. Not the super soldier is gone. Our lab experiment is now blown up. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. right. She's like, oh, I kind of wish that I had, you know, been able to see him more often and have more conversations. Yes. Yeah. I think that's important. And I think that, you know, as kind of this whole scene plays out this week and next, that's going to be an important thing to pay attention to as to like how Peggy is reacting to a lot of these moments that are happening. Because, yeah, when she comes in and he says killed in action, I definitely think there's a turn for her there. And the way that she walks in and delivers those surveillance uh, flight photos, it feels like somebody who has just kind of heard that resolution and is trying to figure out how to how to deal with it. But at this point, is just kind of going through the motions in some capacity. And I think that I, I like the way that she plays that. I like the way it plays out here. Now, I do have a question about the fact that there is no sign of activity from what we could understand. You know, they were about five miles from the enemy lines and uh, the Hydra compound was about 35 miles in. So they're roughly 40 miles, give or take, as the crow flies from mm-hmm. the Hydra compound. No sign of activity. And, you know, as we said yesterday, theoretically, or at least in the script, this was about a week later. So, I mean, there's a burning factory that is smoldering. <laughs> there so are, many I would bodies. assume there are dead bodies all over the place, Hydra and not. It was a very strange machine flying through the air that someone might have <laughs> <Yeah>. seen. <laughs> well, right. and, and what is it, like 200 guys that got rescued? Yeah, something right? like that. I mean, that's it's, a lot like, of it's, people. It's a, there's no Don't, way that 200 guys walk 40 miles across a week <laughs> without having to stop at some farmstead. And like, like they need sustenance. And so I like that it's not like a week later because they could get the 40 miles it like, but without it, it feels like it feels like it's the next morning. Like they walked all night and they showed up, which is also not going to be viable, right? 40 miles in, in a day on a, you know, for, for malnourished soldiers is probably not going to happen. So it's got to be like two to three days. If it's 40 miles, a relaxed walk. I'm, I'm looking at the calculator site where it says, how long does it take to walk a mile? Uh, a relaxed walk of 40 miles is about 20 hours. And that's yeah. relaxed. So if we're having people who are malnourished, who've been in prison, you know it's going to probably take at least double that. Yeah. And so it feels like, it, like we, when we get to it, it feels like they're showing up the next day. Like, okay, we walked all night. We walked through the day. It's, it's the middle of the day. 
or even the end of the day, and we're finally getting here. But that definitely isn't what happened. <laughs> there's there's something about it that I, I struggle with, the way that it's... The, I mean, we talked about this yesterday, how frustrating it was, the way that they chose to end the action sequence with a dissolve out of an explosion. It's like, whoa, it's a big mystery. Is Steve going to make it or not? The, the whole setup here, and I know, I get it. We talked about like this whole idea of like, the, it's all designed for Colonel Phillips to really be kind of a perspective shift for him. But the way that it plays, I find very frustrating because it's meant to be this mystery. There's no sign of activity. I mean, again, 200 people walking 40 miles, you're going to have like, it's going to look like somebody has been, you know, um, driving a, a herd of cattle through here. Like the ground is going to be all torn up where all these these 200 people were marching. Mm-hmm. Like there's going to be signs. <laughs> like, how are you getting no signs of activity of anything over however many days this is? I, I, I struggle with the way this is. Um, and they've got a tank. Like they're walking and there's, the a tank. Road. there's a tank right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just any tank like it is a hydro mini tank that shoots tesseract laser blasts <laughs> oh yeah that's very so, hard to spot those there, there, there's the camouflage <laughs> element <laughs> that comes with the oh, tesseract maybe that's what it is that they don't realize it but yeah it's it's creating an energy shield around them yes. so no one can see them as well okay outstanding i'm glad we <laughs> deciphered that <laughs> there's the no prize for this <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, you know, it's frustrating. It's frustrating, but you know, it is what it is. Um, the other thing that I want to talk to you all about is this whole idea that, uh, that Colonel Phillips has with, uh, agent Carter as the whole logic as to what's happened because she has a crush. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. He didn't want to send anybody in Mm -hmm. because he said the way we're going to rescue everybody is just by winning the war. So, okay, so we're going to leave those 200 POWs over there. They might be getting killed for all we know. Who knows? They might be, uh, you know, manufacturing uh, enemy weapons. Yeah, they could already be dead. Who knows? But we're not going to do anything about it. All she does is send one person in, just one soldier. And um, and now he's blaming the death of all of the men on her. Is that I mean, is there any logic to his perspective here? No, no, nope. <laughs> okay, I'm not crazy. Good, yeah. when, Good talk. when you lay it out like that, he's totally wrong. <laughs> I mean, I was ready to say no before you laid it out like that, but you really made a lot of good points along the way. <laughs> and and as as he kind of established, like not even a soldier in his eyes. Right? Yeah, it's it's an acting monkey is basically what he sees him as. So, for from his perspective, it's just like we're not really losing anything. I don't know. But the, yeah, why is he so mad about it? If we're really not losing anything, why are you so bent out of shape? They weren't doing anything else with Steve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I think it's because he secretly also had a crush, but but Steve clearly likes her more than he likes him. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't know. I, just the fact that he even calls it a crush, like that bothers me because it's just like there's no sign of that just because she is a woman and he is a man. And like, like I feel like he is going through so many hoops and I feel like the writers, this is what frustrates me with this scene is it feels like the writers are putting this in place so that we can have the character change of Colonel Phillips over the course of the film from a non-believer mm. to somebody who does believe and is actually you know, supporting um, what what uh, Captain America is doing. And this feels just like such a forced way to kind of emphasize the fact that I'm really not believing in this guy right now, and it's all your fault. And I, I end up really struggling with it because he doesn't didn't seem interested in the program that much, and now he's saying the program's going to die. It's just like, I just don't know why he is acting the way he is, and I end up finding it very frustrating. I, I think what we're finding is they really didn't know how to come out of this action sequence. <laughs> <laughs> in, in more ways than one. Oh in, in, no! In more ways than one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So many, so many ways, so many issues with it. But um, you know, I don't know. At least we get another moment with Haley Atwell, and you know what I like about her is she does hold her own against Colonel Phillips. I like that she's she, and she doesn't even get in his face about saying it's a crush. She just says it wasn't that I had faith. And I like that. It actually is a simple way to kind of define her belief in the program, in Steve, in Dr. Erskine, and everything that they had going. And I, I feel like it, there's, there is a simplicity with that, that at least in the scene of other things that I find very frustrating, I like the way that she responds to that. Does that play for you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And one thing that I also want to uh, praise. So I was just scrubbing through the scene in part so I could see her come through the tiny door again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like just 
even if we're having some issues with the lines of argument that are being presented or the dialogue that was written for this screen or for this scene, pay attention to the, like, the blocking and the camera movements that they give for this simple conversation between two people. It is such good work for um, how they're going to place each of these two characters on the screen throughout this, this one minute of time. Yeah. And uh, it, it just shows again, like when you have uh, this experienced director who knows what he's doing, uh, he is able to make a conversation between two people like just work in terms of like just nuts and bolts filming <laughs> of you know I'm, I'm just gonna have their their placement and the camera movement and everything just work so well to add visual interest to this quick conversation and that maybe we're not wild about the content of the conversation itself but visually he's really nailing the way that you're supposed to use a camera uh to to um shoot this kind of action i mean like there's a moment around 20 seconds in where uh phillips walks in front of carter and the, the camera tracks with him and everything. It's like, oh, yeah, that's a really good, just like simple blocking for a conversation. And so often conversations can be boring. And, and Joe Johnston knows what he's doing. Yeah. And that's a good example, too, because the way that that the end of his move is like he is looking screen left and she is looking screen right. Like they're not even looking at each other and they're they're facing different planes entirely. So it's an interesting mm-hmm. way to kind of divide these two in in so many different ways in space, in direction of of that they're pointing and obviously in opinion and everything. And so it, that's great the way all of that works. And then you're right, like when we get that other camera move later, as their conversation continues, kind of moving around kind of behind her to come over her shoulder as he moves back toward her. I mean, it's, it's well structured, which that that's a great uh, thing to bring up. How do you two feel about like the direction um, across the Marvel Cinematic Universe as far as I mean, oftentimes they're bringing in, uh, you know, independent directors who don't necessarily have like the action cred, who are then essentially being led by Feige and kind of the, the you know, second unit team to do the action sequences and stuff. How does that work for you? Are you finding that moments like this in a film directed by Joe Johnston stand out because it is a filmmaker like Joe Johnston as opposed to some of these other filmmakers? Or do you, do you feel like they still find ways to make it work? I mean, Joe Johnston's an interesting example because he's like maybe the most experienced director who worked on a, on a Marvel movie. Yeah, possibly. Right? Right. Like he would he would be yeah. notably more experienced than Favreau or Whedon or and and then when they start bringing in, you know, the the indie directors it's like, yeah, they're just kind of inherently less experienced. And so Joe Johnston really has like put in the time behind the camera for you know, 20 years before he makes Captain America. Um in addition to to years coming up in in the industry and everything. And so it's it's kind of hard to compare him and I don't think I have thought about this kind of directing right like these conversations and stuff in um in the other movies very much but it like this is one of the ones that feels like there is a a very clear director stamp um even in the action sequences yeah right there's a certain a certain tone to it that's different from the other marvel movies Uh, with marvel they are locked into a certain tone because of what they're adapting and you know the genre they're in it's always gonna be superhero right like like as a studio we will always be doing superhero they find some ways to try and work around that by doing superhero plus you know like okay this one's superhero and spy this one is like we're watching superhero right. and war movie uh and, and heist gonna, and yeah and superhero <laughs> and heist and uh superhero and ally McBeal and horror with uh you know multiverse of madness and yeah. i i think that's a good way to try and provide that sense of difference in what could start to feel too same. And I think also allowing the directors to put their own stamp a bit on things uh, is a good way to allow um, a little bit of uh, individuality to be present in each Marvel film. And so I like it when they do bring in a different director and you get some sense of uh, you know, their own visual style or their own emphasis on certain themes or color palettes. Um, because there is, I think, uh, w- w- how many movies are we in? You you guys have your schedule laid out for what, years? <laughs> like, how many years oh, are you going to be? Yeah. De- decades. <laughs> yeah, decades uh, that, that you're going to be able to be doing this uh, because of the pace at which Marvel is putting out these films. You need that differentiation, but you also want it to be 
what you're expecting. Like you want that comfort of like, okay, I'm going in for a superhero film. I want that. I don't want to be too different that I'm going to reject it as like, uh, you've gone too far. And so I want them to keep playing with the different genres, superhero plus, but also allow their directors to come in with a little bit of their own style. And there's going to be enough of the house style that's going to come through, like you said, in the action sequences where they've got some set, you know, units that often go out and, and do uh, a lot of the action work uh, in these. And I think one place where we see Joe Johnston's stamp on this is this kind of assured confidence in taking a simple scene and providing good blocking for the actors and good movement for the camera that makes it more interesting than it could have been. Well, yeah, I also want to want to add to that. I've heard on like other film podcasts or or you know just podcasts in general or you know seen in commentary about stuff that um, people sometimes criticize films for having a lot of cuts, right? For having a, a you know cut to cut to cut to even during small conversations and a, that that tone of critique tends to indicate that they think that not cutting is a sign of a better filmmaker right let the actors be on the screen and all that sort of stuff but i think like the like the the golden mean between those is this scene where like there are cuts but they're used for a purpose they're dynamic and they contribute to you know, the, the conversation that's being had between the characters. And so yeah. I don't think a scene like this should have zero cuts and just have the, the actors standing still, you know, facing each other or not facing each other. And I don't think it should have, you know, cuts every three seconds, but like this conversation is better for having the edits that it has. The edits and the movement. Yeah. 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 And yeah. the movement in yeah. particular, maybe. Right, right. Well, yeah, I think there's some there's a lot to say about um, the different styles of directors across it. But I do think that there's a value in having someone with that history in the industry that that Johnston brings when he's able to kind of have a background in visual effects, have an understanding as to how to construct scenes. And I think he's coming into this, and I know he hasn't directed a ton of films, but he's been in the industry for decades. And having that experience, I think, really shows when you have just a simple dialogue scene like this. And I think it plays really nicely. So, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up as, a, as the positive in this scene. <laughs> Um, you know, toward the end of the scene, we do get, uh, you know, troops, you can see in the background, some troops start running. You hear some walla from soldiers. You're not going to believe this. Things like that, that are in the back hinting at something that is happening. Colonel Phillips and, uh, agent Carter stop their conversation and Phillips says, what the hell is going on out there? And that's, that's where we end the minute. It's a, it's another wait, bit of a cliffhanger. Wait. He exits oh. through the small door. I just want to say that. <laughs> he does. <laughs> So so did the corporal oh, earlier on. Standing. You think oh, that maybe funny. that it yeah, it's it's a funny thing. Like uh, maybe there's a, a a thin plastic over the <laughs> over the sides, <laughs> like they're treating it like a window or something. <laughs> That's very funny. Oh, I never would have I, I never would have given that a moment's thought if we weren't doing this kind of podcast. Oh, it's so great. I know. I know. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> Well, one of the things we like to uh, talk about toward the end of the week with our guests is favorite Captain America moments in the franchise or in the comics or anything. And I'm curious with the two of you, what would you say is your favorite Captain America moment or one of your favorites? Uh, because there are a lot of great ones. When he turned into a werewolf uh, in the in the mid 90s, <laughs> uh, the, the, the Cap Wolf saga, um, just such glorious comic book absurdity everything you could want uh <laughs> is is in that arc i did a podcast episode uh, about that arc over on the protagonist podcast cap wolf is is as far as the comics are concerned like it's it never has gotten better than that i mean <laughs> yes there are better stories that have been told <laughs> you know the death of captain america was a really well done story uh he's, he's had a lot of other like technically better stories but as far as like good old superhero strangeness give me cap wolf any day of the week Oh, that's awesome. Haven't had that one pop up yet. So. No, that's a first. <laughs> that's outstanding. Oh, that's great. Uh, for me, I think it, it really is some of the finale stuff in um, Endgame. It just kind of yeah. unbeatable for, for the entire MCU franchise. Any particular thing? Are you talking about like, uh, you know, picking up Thor's hammer um, or are you talking later like the dance or or everything like from no, one to I, the... I, I, I think I'm leaning towards like the action finale with the with the hammer. Um, gotcha. Okay. I think that's the the big one. Just like those five minutes once he gets yeah. it and, and just like every single move. 
and it's just going so it, like everything's perfect in that moment <laughs> If any listeners are wanting to go track it down, I'll just say the Cap Wolf uh, does begin in issue number 402 <laughs> of Captain America. And this plot line is going to involve, because it is the uh, mid-90s, both Wolverine and Cable showing up. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> now it's, I definitely have to check that out. That it's is a amazing. Wild. It's a wild thing that hopefully someday we'll get in the MCU, right, Joseph? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. And See, I, I just want him to throw in, like, just go ahead and put him on the moon while he's in capital form. Like, just on the moon. That's, oh, there you oh, go. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> that seems like something, like, they could totally what if that in some capacity. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've already done the zombies. Let's bring the werewolf version in. That'd be fun. That's probably the best place for it. <laughs> yeah, pro- it's the only place they could bring it in where it would feel like it could kind of be okay, you know? Um, well, both of you, Andrew, Joe, uh, it has been a wonderful week full of great conversations. Thank you both so much for coming in and joining us here on the show this week. Thank you for having us. I really do truly enjoy doing these movie by minute podcasts and the Marvel universe mm-hmm. is something near and dear to me, uh, in, in comic book forum, but also in its cinematic variation. I just appreciate that I could spend so much quality time with you guys together all week long. So I really thank you. I've missed you since the last time we podcasted together. And this week was a real peak. He was in such (laughs) awe that he just was speechless for so (laughs) so much. (laughs) Well, remind everybody uh, where they can tune into uh, what you two are up to one last time. Uh, yeah, I, so I um, academically do some close looks at pop culture, so you can look at my Amazon author page and see uh, many essay collections I've edited on superhero comic books and done a few books on TV shows as well. And then I also host the Protagonist Podcast, where each week we look at a great character in a great story, like Cap Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> and can I'm I, on... I'm on Disney Animation Minute Essentials, uh, another Movies by Minutes podcast. Uh, and I should also mention, and I think I think we've we've been negligent not to mention Joseph and I have been on a number of other movies by minutes podcasts, um, like Spider Man Minute and and uh, all kinds of other uh, Bride things. Minute. Be- between the two of us, Groundhog some Day of us minute. together, <laughs> yeah, so, sometimes together, sometimes independently. Um, but there's a lot of movies by minutes, and and if you explore, you'll find us here and there. Like so many of us, we love this format, and yeah, we're, we're all over the place, and I love that you two uh, pop in on so many of them, so that's that's awesome. So I'm glad you called that out. Uh, you can you can just find all the Movies by Minutes, if you haven't checked it out, moviesbyminutes.com. Uh, there is a page that lists uh, all the ones that are out there, and there are a ton. So poke around in there, you'll find surely something, that, something else other than this, of course that you want to tune into. There's a lot of good stuff. So check it out. It's fun. Uh, We are closing out the week on this cliffhanger of what's going on outside the tent. Uh, We'll be back next time. So Pete, thank you as always. With respect, Andy, I don't regret my actions because I had a crush. (laughs) Until next time, true believers. Marvel Movie Minute is a production of True Story FM. Engineering by Andy Nelson. This season's music is Spread the News by Anthony Vega. And this season's show art is by Winston Yabo. Find the show at truestory.fm. And if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, consider doing that for this show.